Good afternoon, welcome to another AP US History video with Mr. Pate. And this is another in the series of review videos getting you ready for the exam. We're going to give you a landscape macro sized overview of the Cold War with a map to kind of help you have context to geographically where things were happening. Starting out, we have Truman as the first president. The last video I did showed the cause of the Cold War. Truman now, his strategy is going to be called containment. And this is as he becomes aware of from George Kennan and from Winston Churchill that there is a Soviet threat that Eastern Europe is not being given back and that Eastern Europe is basically this new kind of Soviet buffer zone block that's forcibly being held as communist. You're going to see a number of things happen in the Truman years where containment strategy is used. The idea is basically contain communism where it is. So you have uh, in Berlin you're going to have the Berlin airlift when West Berlin is closed off. Of course, that was all within the East German sector. Uh, it's going to be closed off by Stalin, and he's attempting to basically just get the United States to back down and assert himself. But Truman is no appeaser. He's going to spend a year basically doing airlifts to keep uh, West Germans resupplied until Stalin kind of gives in. Uh, so containment seen right there. We're also going to see that containment is going to be in the form of alliances being created. So we have NATO in Western Europe, and NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is designed to stop uh, Soviet invasion of anybody and attack against one will be attacked against all. And you also are going to see that the crippled countries that are just shattered economically and physically and needing rebuilding and needing an economic hand up in Western Europe and really throughout Europe. Uh, the Western ones that are not Soviet satellites, to keep them from crumbling, a couple of things are going to be done. Truman is going to institute the Marshall Plan, which is going to be financial assistance for non-communist countries. He's also going to uh, introduce the Truman Doctrine, specifically to help Greece and Turkey, which had communist insurgents actively trying to take over their governments, supported and funded and armed by the Soviet Union. So the Truman Doctrine comes specifically to the aid of Greece and France, NATO and Marshall Plan are to the aid of Western Europe to kind of shore them up and help them out. At the same time, bad things are happening elsewhere from the U.S. perspective. China falls to communism in 1949, and when that happens, you also very soon after you see the Soviet Union is going to have uh, the first detonation of an atomic bomb, and the United States is going to freak out. They have a new Red Scare that develops, and uh, basically the United States is going to respond to these threats over here uh, and this kind of spread of communism with NSC 68 which is um, basically the you know National Security Council recommendation they need a massive in increase in the amount of bombers and missiles and uh, nuclear bombs just a huge increase in the military so there's not a falling behind and a gap that develops of course Truman also has the Korean War, where with the blessing of the Soviet Union, North Korea launches a surprise invasion on South Korea. The United States has a police action declared by the UN, gets involved. Eventually, MacArthur is going to be successful in pushing back the North Koreans. He goes too far. China gets involved. Stalemate. Eventually, they end with the exact same 38th parallel that they have today. These are a number of things going on, and a lot of stuff over here in Southeast Asia, a lot of stuff in kind of Western Europe and then as well down with Turkey and Greece. So a lot of European and Asian things going on in the Truman years. Eisenhower. Eisenhower is saying it's not good enough to have containment. We need to roll back. We need to push them back. And he also says we need to go further than just like a NATO alliance and have massive retaliation. Um, although he's going to do some alliances as well. This theory is proven to not work very well because well, Hungary is a key situation. Uh, the United States encourages Hungarians to revolt. They do, and then what? The Soviets roll in tanks. What's the United States going to do? Start a hot war in Hungary that could escalate into a nuclear war? Nope. So Hungarians get crushed. The United States fails to fulfill their promise they'd made, and it doesn't look very good. Um, also, uh, you get this idea of mutually assured destruction. Both sides have so many nukes now that you know anyone, the, the world will be destroyed if you launch, you lose too. And so this is going to kind of be a deterrent against nuclear war happening, although nuclear escalation of arms race continues to happen, which is kind of strange. 
Um, you have the Eisenhower Doctrine in the Middle East and the United States, which has several kind of allies and one strong ally in Israel, is going to say that they will ensure the security of any Middle Eastern countries and they form kind of a Middle East Asian treaty organization to protect oil-rich countries that are allied with the United States from communism. Um, this is the mito, and uh, it's the fulfillment of the Eisenhower Doctrine. So even though Eisenhower is saying rollback, it turns out to be impractical in a nuclear age, he ends up settling for more alliances, and his key area of focus is the Middle East. Um, okay, moving on to, oh, and he's one other thing in the Middle East also, you've got the Suez Crisis, where the Suez Canal is nationalized by Egyptians, Israel, France, and Britain attack. They're taking down Egypt. The United States forces them to back off because Khrushchev says he'll send in Soviet troops and weapons. This looks like it could escalate into a hot war. So the Soviet Union, uh, the U.S. forces its allies, Israel, France, and Britain, to back off in the name of avoiding a big war. Okay, on to Kennedy. His big thing is flexible response, saying more nuclear weapons can't solve everything, and you see the folly of this with Hungary. So it is the idea of doing things like attempting... Uh, you know, through the Alliance for Progress to help Latin America out and economically have its kind of own little Marshall Plan to assist it to not become communist. It's through counterinsurgency forces, starting the special forces to be able to go and fight communist guerrillas kind of without getting into like this big armed warfare. It would be small special forces type of fighting. Uh, also, another thing that's going to happen um, with Kennedy is he is, you know, going to escort U.S. involvement in Vietnam a little bit, and that's, you know, something that had started slightly with Truman and slightly a little more with Eisenhower. He's going to escort it some. There's speculation he might have pulled out of Vietnam had he lived. Nothing conclusive. But what we do know um, is that there are some other things that go on with Kennedy around Cuba. So what's going to happen with Cuba, of course, which I'm sure you're familiar with, students, uh, Bay of Pigs, and that is something that is going to completely flop trying to use uh, Cuban expatriates and get them to go and take over Cuba. It's unsuccessful. Uh, it should have a little bit of red around Cuba because it is communist aligned at this time. But uh, essentially, it's going to flop. The next, uh, you know, shortly after that, you're going to have the Cuban Missile Crisis where the United States detects that Soviets are putting in nuclear tip missiles into Cuba, very close to the Florida coastline, and this is where Kennedy's going to put a naval quarantine around Cuba, and eventually the Soviet ships turn around and go back, and the world takes a deep breath at the closest they ever get to, uh, you know, brink of disaster and just a worldwide nuclear war and, and crushing defeat. Now, a couple of things that happen, starting in Eisenhower, that I don't want to forget, are the idea of summits. With Stalin, this never really was going to happen, but the idea of summits you may remember the kitchen debate with Nixon. There are going to be a couple of summits between Eisenhower uh, and Nixon and Khrushchev. There are going to be um, some more talks and attempts at things like this uh, under Kennedy, especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis, because both sides take a deep breath and go, whew, and you're going to get a nuclear test ban treaty shortly after Kennedy's death that Johnson's going to get through. Johnson's Cold War period is really dominated by Vietnam, and... You know, this is the big ex escalation with the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. You're going to see that the United States goes from like, you know, less than 100,000 people being involved to over half a million in a very short period of time, a couple of years, as a result of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. And Johnson basically for the rest of his time is going to have half a million plus troops waging this massive war in Vietnam. It becomes so unpopular after the Tet Offensive, he actually pulls out and decides not to run again. So Vietnam slays him as well in some ways politically. Um, Nixon is going to come in and pledge to get out peace with honor in Vietnam. And Vietnam is going to be the dominant thing in his period as well, although it involves some other countries as well. He does Vietnamization. He tries to um, bomb the North Vietnamese to the peace table to gradually turn over the war to the North Vietnamese or the South Vietnamese and to gradually get troops out and and to his credit he does I mean by 19 
72 election, the vast majority of U.S. troops have gotten out in four years. It's a small fighting force, even though it's deeply unpopular and a lot of bombing is still going on. Um, what Nixon does skillfully is he enters into detente, which means an easing of tensions and this kind of idea of re real politic, this idea of practical politics and what's the pragmatic thing to do. Nixon is going to visit China then later on after kind of like giving some clout and supremacy in some ways to China as, you know, by visiting them before visiting the Soviet Union. He's kind of, hey, I'm recognizing you first really is like more favorable. He makes some trade agreements and gives some other uh, privileges uh, trade-wise to China. Later on that year, he makes an agreement with the Soviet Union when he visits Moscow. And now he's got both of them where he's created a more friendly relationship. He's given them some things they want. And he's able to say, I need you to put some pressure on the North Vietnamese, get him to the peace table, force them there because China and the Soviet Union were supplying North Vietnam. So eventually the Vietnam War comes to a conclusion. Of course, it was a defeat for the United States and not the peace with honor that Nixon sought. But detente was his approach. And that kind of continues under Ford and Carter for the most part. They do, you know, you have the SALT 1 and SALT 2 uh, arms reduction treaties during the 1970s. And they are just trying to kind of maintain this idea of keep arms reduction going on. However, you get kind of a, a, a black eye at the end of the um, Carter years with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which leads to Carter doing a boycott of the Moscow Olympics, suspending grain shipments to Soviet Union that had been agreed uh, upon earlier by Nixon uh, because the Soviet Union could not match their production with their so-called mighty economic system that really wasn't so mighty at all. Um, by the 1980s, the CIA knew that the Soviets were kind of maxed out economically and their system was, you know, in a bad, bad situation. And so Nixon, or excuse me, Reagan is going to start out with what we would say the evil empire speech. And he brings clarity to, you know, the Soviet Union is this great threat to freedom and security of the world. And he just calls them out, basically. Um, but what he's going to do to his credit, he's going to do a huge arms race, which does increase the national debt significantly in the United States, does kind of uh, hurt Reaganomics, the supply side economics in some ways by ballooning that debt. But he does spin the Soviet Union, even with the uh, never working SDI Star Wars system, he does spin the Soviet Union into bankruptcy because they're forced to keep matching him uh, all along the way. By the time you get to the mid 80s, uh, the deaths of two Soviet premiers in short succession uh, are going to lead to a new leader who turns out to be a reformist named Mikhail Gorbachev. And he is going to um, come in and start, start doing some things. Um, Reagan is going to say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Talking about the Berlin Wall, the symbol of kind of the Iron Curtain over all of Eastern Europe and lack of freedom. Gorbachev is going to say, our system is collapsing, we need to do some restructuring. So he ushers in this policy of glasnost, which is kind of this freedom and a little bit more, slight freedom, a little bit more openness and transparency in government, because there basically had been zero before this, and a little bit more media freedom, uh, a little bit of people could actually come from other countries into the Soviet Union, and again, they have security, but it's not quite as tight. It's not like North Korea today or something. Um, it's not a total police state quite as much. I remember one of my friends in high school got to go over on like a soccer exchange tour. Soviet players came to Oregon and he and other guys from our city got to go on a tour and place uh, Soviet high school students in several cities. Well, that could never have happened before Glasnost and this kind of openness began. Perestroika is an attempt at kind of some economic restructuring to go on as well. And you start to see these summits between uh, Reagan and Gorbachev. And these things are ultimately going to keep warming up relations to where, wow, it doesn't seem like it's such a hostile relationship anymore. And in 1989, uh, you have a solidarity movement start among like workers in Poland. And it's going to be kind of unchallenged uh, by the Soviet Union. Gorbachev doesn't crack down on it like he had on Hungary and so many other countries in the past. And uh, by this time now, George H.W. Bush is the president, and the Berlin Wall is going to fall, and then you're going to see country after country. Czechoslovakia is going to get rid of their dictator, Ceausescu, 
who is just awful. Um, you're going to see lots and lots of um, these countries in Eastern Europe throw off the oppression with the Soviets, uh, choosing not to come in and, and crush the revolts. So it's a total opposite of Hungary. In 1991, um, hardliners attempt a coup uh, against Gorbachev when he's vacationing. And um, the Soviet people then stand up, led by Boris Yeltsin, uh, who will later become the president of Russia. The people kind of stand up. The army refuses to stop them. And this really becomes the collapse of the Soviet Union. It temporarily becomes the Commonwealth of Independent States and eventually breaks off into a variety of separate countries, these different Soviet republics. Of course, the far by largest was Russia. Hopefully this kind of overall view gives you an idea of the locations at different times that stuff was going on with the Cold War. Blue kind of represented U.S. alliances. Um, you know, you can barely see the Philippines and Japan. You've got Australia, uh, Western Europe, U.S. and Canada. You've got some Soviet ones. There are some other smaller episodes in the Cold War. We can't cover everything. But this gives you an idea of kind of the major theme, major events during each of the presidencies during the 45 plus years of the Cold War. That's all the time we have for today. Stay classy, A-Push.